Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that everybody can enjoy regardless of hair color. Speaking of hair color, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk all about Jinja. It's the first game made specifically for those kooky redheads that we all know and love. And I... What's that? There are no redheads in Japan. In Jinja, two to five players attempt to gain the most honor by building shrines all over Japan. And they're going to do this in all sorts of kooky ways using a worker placement system. Depending on player count, players are going to get a number of workers and some various other assorted items. They're going to have uh, be dealt five Omakuji cards. Now these Omakuji cards are going to have kind of special scoring conditions for the end of the game. You're going to pick three of these and then uh, discard the other two. You'll have opportunities to get more Omakuji cards as the game progresses. You're also going to get, uh, through a draft system, a number of deed cards. And these deed cards are going to tell you exactly how you can build uh, these shrines around the uh, country. It's going to tell you the various uh, items that you will need, the resources that you will need in order to make that happen. The game board is a map of Japan. It's divided up into several different sections based on color. These different sections are going to have spaces for resources. They're also going to have a space for a lantern, which is going to give a special uh, bonus uh, depending on certain factors. And you're also then going to have space to build the shrines on Japan itself. Now you're going to lay out five Kitsune cards, and these Kitsune cards are uh, kind of event cards, condition cards for that specific round. So every round you're going to flip one of those over, and you, for that specific round you do whatever that specific card tells you to do. Players can go ahead and take advantage of those cards and, and take the actions on them if they like uh, before the actual game round begins. So once the season begins in earnest, the players are then going to place their uh, workers in the different spots. Now you can, first of all, uh, you can place them in the different um, uh, areas around Japan. If you place them in those spots in the different areas around Japan, you can do a couple of things. First of all, um, there will be distributed every round in these, uh, in these areas, there will be um, these resource tokens. Uh, you go ahead and if you put your worker there, you can go ahead and grab those resources that are there and claim those for yourself. Conversely, if you already have enough resources to on, on one of your deed cards, you can go ahead and go to that space and build a shrine by paying all of those resources back into the bag. Now, if you've done that, you can go ahead and claim that card, which gives you a point value in honor, and it will also give you a special end-of-season conditions that you can take advantage of throughout the game. Those deed cards come in small, which are easy, medium, which are medium difficulty, and then the large ones, which are very hard. Players can do different things during the game. For instance, if they go to one space, they can go ahead and get rid of one of their deed cards, discard it, and then that allows them to draw three resource cards from the bag, but it also allows every other player to draw one resource from the bag. You go to one space and you can spend a couple of gold to get either an Omakuji card or another deed card. You can go to the fortune spot, which allows you to draw two Omakuji cards and then you have to discard one. You go to the gain territory resource space. Essentially, you put a guy here and you can claim the resources from any spot, even if somebody else already occupies it, or if you just don't want to go there. You can go to the territory build. So you can go there and for one gold, you can build in any territory, even if it's already occupied. You can go to the change lantern bonus. So around the board, you've got the various lanterns in the different spaces that are on blue. You can go ahead and flip them you can flip two of them to their red side, and then you can pick uh, a, an advantage from one of those that you want to gain. It can be honor, it can be gold, it can be drawing another resource from the bag. You can do a minor offering, meaning you pay two gold and you roll a die. If it comes up uh, red or uh, blue, you can get either three or five honor points for that. And if it comes up as a star, you can go ahead and uh, 
get the appropriate level of uh, honor points because they're colored, uh, and then you can essentially get the advantage of one of the lanterns on the board. You can do a major offering and just pay four gold to get six points, six honor points on the board. You can also pay two gold to buy uh, specific resources from the bag. It's not a blind draw. Um, and you pay as many as you want at a max of five in order to, to keep drawing those. Or you can sell uh, resources you already have for one. You can roll for structures, meaning you can get, uh, depending on how it comes up, you can either get two random uh, resources, re structure resources, or you can get, and get one that you choose. Or you can pay one gold to just get two random uh, structure resources. There's also a supplement gold place. You go there and any gold that's been added over the turns, you can just claim that gold. And you can also roll for gold, meaning depending on what you rolled, you will get that much gold. So players go around and around using the various worker spaces and you're trying to, as I say, ultimately build those uh, shrines using your deed cards. That's going to give you points, but it's also going to give you advantages because at the end of the round, at the end of every round, you can uh, essentially, uh, any shrines you have, you get the, the lantern advantage uh, from the area that shrine is in. And then you also get to uh, do all the advantages on all of your built shrines. They're going to give you specific advantages uh, in money and resource tokens and in other things that's going to help you advance in the game. Players go around and around, they're building the shrines, they're claiming those resources, they are getting those bonuses, and you go till the end of Season 5. At the end of Season 5, once that's completed, you go to final scoring. Each five tokens you have, those are structure resources and gold, for every five of those you have in any combination, you get two honor points. If you have any fox tokens, and fox tokens let you to let you go to places where people are already there, if you still have any fox tokens left over at the end of the game, they are worth three honor points. The shrines, depending on if they're small, medium, or large, are going to give you three, five, or seven honor points, and you'll score those as well. You will reveal your Omakuji cards, and when you look at your Omakuji cards, it will tell you if you have uh, built shrines in certain places or done other certain specific things around the board, you will gain a number of points, uh, honor points that way as well. Finally, whoever has the most shrines in a specific region will gain eight honor points, and then you're going to go ahead and total those all up, and whoever has the most honor points wins! Jinja! So Jinja is a worker placement game. It's a very simple uh, worker placement game um, in that it's not difficult to learn or to, or to teach, uh, and once you pick it up, you pick it up pretty quick, and it moves pretty quickly as well. Um, first of all, I'm... Uh, uh, I'm not a, the, the biggest worker placement fan. I mean, there's some that I really like, um, but it's not necessarily my favorite mechanic uh, in a game. I enjoy it. I, I don't love it. And really, it comes down to theme, and, and, and if there's something really fun and unusual and special there that, that can get me on board is, is kind of what's going to make me like it. Um, I was surprised, however, at just how much I actually enjoy Jinja. It's, it's, it's light, and, but it's quick, and it's fun, and there's some real competition here. And I really like the Omikuji cards because they, they're the kind of these surprise bonuses you don't know are coming up. And if you're collecting them over the course of the game, you may be able to score a lot of different things. So there's, you don't know right until the end of the game if people's Omikuji cards are going to trigger. And you, you just don't know. And, and, and it's a race, and, and you're keeping track kind of mentally of where you are, but you don't know where everybody else is. And so that's, that's, that's kind of fun. Holly actually said it reminded her of Ticket to Ride. Uh, she said that the, the game, she got a real Ticket to Ride vibe from it. Uh, I guess I can see that. Um, it, 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 there's enough of a... Uh, there's lightness here, but there's enough meat that it was still rather enjoyable. But I and I liked it precisely because it was light, because it didn't have pretensions. It wasn't this big, you know. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna math the crap out of this game, you know. No, it was just just you're gonna do this, you're gonna do this, and and try to maximize your points, and it worked very well. Uh, generally, I liked uh, playing the game quite a bit. One thing I do want to point out, the board quality is not good um so whenever i get a game and you know and the the boards the the it's kind of bent i, I typically just kind of barely you know bend it the other way to kind of straighten it out and i'm very always very careful and delicate when i do that i put the slightest pressure on this to to bend the 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 board to straighten the board bend it just snapped right off one uh section of my board then is separated from the rest of the board and it's so that was disappointing. You know, you, you kind of want some quality uh, when you buy a game and your components. This one, certainly the board is not, is not as uh, nice as it should have been. 
But having said that, uh, really that's my only complaint. For what this game is, it's a lot of fun. If you if you like worker placement, if you like kind of lighter, quicker games that still have some real meat to them and fun to them, I think you'll really get a kick out of Jinja. Recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer is, yeah, go ahead, buy it. Thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to leave a comment on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We'd ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. I'd ask you, ladies and gentlemen, if you like uh, military history, to please check out my other channel, that is uh, Cody Carlson PhD, here on YouTube, where I talk about all sorts of uh, military history topics and books and have a lot of fun there as well. And I'd also ask you to leave a thumb for this video on Board Game Geek if you've enjoyed it. That, too, helps us out. Really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, i got to be honest with you, I have no idea what omikuji means in Japanese, but I do know that whenever somebody kicks me in my delicate areas, that is the first thing that I scream. Please somebody help me on my feet again, and I don't know where I'm going, and I don't know where I've been. Please somebody help me on the solid ground, it's a long time. Number two, Time Distortions, Captain One-Eyed Peterson and the Legends of the Falkland War in Three Acts, Part One, The Ugly Chambermaid in a Closet of Mystery, an alien deck-building game.